about uh, Mac OS security. I've got iOS in parentheses. I think a little bit of it applies, but it's mostly going to be about uh, the Mac side of the world. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm amazed this many people came. It sounds like a boring subject, but uh, maybe it's to challenge me or something, so that'll be fun. I want to start with a couple of... Uh, hey, Charlie, you want to keep it down back there? Shh. We're working here. So I wanted to start with a couple of definitions to make sure we're all on the same page. Malware is a phrase that just means generically anything bad somebody did to try to infect your machine. It can be to steal all your data, it can be uh, to crash your hard drive, it can be to make your system a bot, and we'll get into some of that. But it's kind of a generic, all-encompassing term. One of my pet peeves is when people use the word virus and it's not really a virus. So if you think about it in terms of medicine, a virus has to be self-replicating, right? A virus doesn't just hit you and then never go anywhere, as everyone in the room with a cold can uh, attest to, right? So a virus is self-replicating self malware that moves from machine to machine and often without active participation by the, by the person who's got it. So in the uh, early days, a lot of the malware, or even still today, would come through an email and then it goes in and grabs all your contacts and sends that malware off to all of your contacts as well. So that's how it self-replicates frequently. A Trojan horse is different. A Trojan horse is something pretending to be something else, as the old uh, uh, situation was. So it masquerades as something else, like, you know, oh, look, here's free Photoshop. That sounds like a good idea. What could possibly go wrong, wrong if I download that? Uh, so you're going to get malware when you go look at it, stuff like that. Um, uh, there were, we'll get into talking about video codecs as well. There was a real spate of, of uh, video codecs where you get this alarming thing telling you you needed one, and then you were infected after that. So I wanted to make sure we keep those definitions separate because it is important in the progression of where we are today. So I'm going to start with a, a history lesson, go through where we were and where we are now, uh, and then uh, talk about some practical things we can do to be safe. In 2004 uh, to 2007, I call this blissful ignorance. This is where we had smarmy little looks on our faces at those poor little Windows people and their icky little viruses. Nothing affecting us, and it was wonderful. In 2004, there was a Renipo worm that was a proof of concept. And I remember saying, these are all Mac things, by the way. So I remember saying, oh, well, you know, that's just proof of concept. It's not actually in the wild, you know, so that doesn't count. Uh, 2006, we were in full denial with the, uh, there was the Leap A virus. And I remember that one as well. I remember saying, well, yes, but it's only infected 100 people if you actually check over at Symantec.com. So that one didn't count, right? In 2007, things started to get a little bit weird, but uh, that was when the macro virus hit the uh, Microsoft Office suite. Now, that one was fun because we could blame Microsoft for it, so it wasn't Ma Apple's fault, right? And I, I remember when uh, the, the whole macro thing still drives you crazy, right? You're running Microsoft Office, and you get a file from somebody, and it says it won't run because you've got to enable the, uh, the uh, macros and that sort of thing. That's all because of back in 2007 with that macro virus. Then we started getting some of the fun porn viruses, the Bad Bunny, and uh, there was also a financial trojan for the Mac and Windows, which offered the porn if that was what you were really looking for. <clears throat> In 2008 was when things started to really heat up. Uh, there was some scareware called Mac Sweeper that would come in and tell you you were in danger, and of course if you reacted to that fake danger, you were actually in real danger. And uh, Immunizator was the same kind of thing, but they would both threaten that all of your data was going to be erased, and so that's why people <coughs> reacted to it and uh, ended up getting infected. And those were poison, uh, poisoned advert, uh, adverts, as uh, my buddy Bart says. I should mention, I'll talk about it again at the end, but my buddy Bart Bouchotts from uh, BartD.ie was instrumental in the writing of this talk. He's pretty much taught me everything I know about, uh, about uh, security. So then there was uh, Havdi A. It was a Trojan that stole passwords. So that started to get a little more interesting. It could open up your firewall and disable security settings. And that's the worst kind of thing, because that's when they're going to be able to get in and do pretty much anything they want once they've got your firewall off and disabled your security settings. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce the next one. Rikos A. <laughs> Helped you make more Trojans. Then we get into these video codecs, so this is where you go to a website and it would say, you know, you, you followed some sort of string of commands to get to, uh, or a string of uh, invitations to get to a site where you thought you were going to play a video, but it said, oh, you don't have the right codec. Uh, a codec, by the way, is a coder decoder that allows you to be able to watch a certain kind of video. If it was encoded a certain way, you need a decoder to play it. So it's actually true that sometimes you do need an encoder, but these were all fake and uh, caused you all, all kinds of harm. In 2008 was the first time that Apple ever suggested, eh, 
maybe you want to put one of those antiviruses on there, but they very quickly erased that from their website and said, oh, no, no, we didn't mean it. No, no, these are not the droids you're looking for. We don't have that kind of problem here. I enjoyed 2009 because I called it your own darn fall. There were people getting infected right and left, but if you were a good person, you didn't get infected, right? The iWorks Trojan A uh, was specifically targeted to people getting pirated versions of iWork and Photoshop. Well, I was kind of snickering and happy. Yes, yeah, serves you right. Quit misbehaving, and you know, if you play fair, you're not going to get infected. So it was sort of, uh, you know, a smug feeling about that. There was another video virus called Max Cinema, and there was some more porn with the Jalav Trojan. So at this point, we're just we're still fine. In 2010, things start to get a little bit dicier. There was the Pinhead Trojan that allowed hackers to gain remote control of your system. Again, it was still through downloads of illegitimate, of legitimate software through illegitimate sites. Uh, one of them was iPhoto in particular. And then the Bunana worm, uh, I didn't actually explain what a worm is, and I'm not sure I can do an adequate job of that, but it's another kind of malware. But it used a Java applet to target Windows, Mac, and Linux. So now things are starting to get, you know, you just kind of get that queasy feeling that maybe this is happening a little more often than you can actually just ignore. So now you can't ignore it. <laughs> Uh, in 2011-2012, uh, the uh, black hole rat allowed hackers to join uh, to uh, gain remote access to your computer. So basically, they can do anything you can do. If you get the infected with this, you can uh, get hit. Now, I'm sure everybody remembers Mac Defender last year. That was, or was that the beginning? It might be the beginning of this year. Was uh, uh, was pretending to be a legitimate security application, and it was. Um, uh, actually, if you search for Mac security, you would actually find this and get uh, infected if you installed it. At that point, the uh, flashback Trojan hit, and I'm sure everybody remembers that one, uh, was disguised as an update for Adobe Flash. At that point, Apple finally acknowledged that there was a really big problem and provided removal tools for it there. Now, I got this, uh, this history from NakedSecuritySophos.com. Uh, Is there a dot net? I should be wearing my glasses so I can tell you what my charts say. Yes, nakedsecurity.sophos.com, which is a great site for learning about more about security. So what actually changed here? What, what made things go from we were safe and happy to we're not safe and happy? Well, original, originally malware was just plain old vandalism. It was, I'm going to go in and erase all your stuff, and I'm going to put a nasty gram and go, ha ha, I took all your stuff. That was, uh, you know, a very childish time, and, and uh, people were just doing it to prove that they could. But over time now, malware has turned into this multi-billion dollar business. It's actually quite lucrative to spread malware. And I'll get into exactly why. There's uh, also hacktivism. This is where you're hacking for political purposes. I'm sure you've heard of LawSec and Anonymous, where they're hacking for political reasons. There's also digital uh, espionage and sabotage going on. There was uh, a piece of malware called Stuxnet that was distributed specifically to attack Siemens computer systems at Iran's nuclear power program. It was very, very clever stuff. It was written in a way that it actually kept the displays that the, that the workers looked at saying that everything was fine, only it was shutting things down. And they couldn't tell anything was wrong because they had so clever, it was so cleverly written. Uh, there's been suggestions in, in, uh, and guesses as to who wrote that, and I don't think I'll get into the politics of that, but uh, it's certainly interesting. So I talked about it being a multi-billion dollar business. This is the concept of botnets. So a technical bad guy writes some code and gets it distributed onto millions and millions of machines. And if they can get it on all of these machines, they can then control them from a distance. So what they do is they, they, they infect all the machines, but then the, this technical bad guy sells it to extortionists. So now the extortionist goes, say, to a gambling site. Say a gambling site is having a giant tournament on Saturday night. They write to the, uh, to the gambling site and say, well, it would be a shame if your site were to go down right when that big gambling uh, tournament was going to go on where you're going to make all that money. And they threaten them. If they don't uh, pay up, then they basically have every single one of those machines that they control all hit the website at the same time, causing what's called a denial of service attack or a distributed denial of service, service attack. So if everybody hits it at the same time, it'll bring the site down, and then they lose all the money from their tournament. So you can see how this turns into a giant pile of money and is, is actually can be quite lucrative. Any questions on any of that? 
Is it, can you really say a denial of service was malware in the sense that it's just a bunch of people logging into the same site at the same time? So the question was, can you say a denial of service is malware? No, the denial of service isn't malware, but the bot, the, the, okay. the fact that your machine has been turned into a bot is malware. Oh, okay. It, it, it affects your machine. It affects your machine, and then you're one of the people attacking the site. Now, a lot of this uh, did not affect us because we were small in numbers, right? There weren't that many Macs out there. So what's the great advantage of, uh, of having us attack? It's like, well, you, couldn't, you probably couldn't even bring a site down with how many people we were in, in you know, 2003. Yeah, Mike? If, if my machine is affected, then, example, do I uh, even know that's, that's infected? If your machine is infected, would you know? Uh, most likely not. <laughs> I mean, there, there are ways to find out, but you'd have to go looking for it. Um, I know people found uh, situations where the machine would appear to be doing something, and they unplug the Ethernet cable and it stops. Uh, but it also happens on Windows machines anyway, because Microsoft is off doing something on their, on their machine. So you don't really, you often don't know. You might, uh, a lot of people, when they're super infected on Windows, will no, just know that it's slow, and that's all they know. And they don't know if it's because they've been running without cleaning up in a long time, or whether it's because of, uh, you know, some malware. Yeah. I was just wondering if activity monitor might show you something there. Would activity monitor? Yeah, but you don't you don't know exactly what. You might see network traffic, uh -huh. but it might not be that much. It might just be pinging that site, which might be very very small network traffic. Uh -huh. I think, unless the network guy tells me I'm wrong when I say that. So again, why were why were we left alone? You know, uh, OS 10 was built on uh, BSD, which is the Berkeley version of Unix. And uh, it was written very, very long time ago, and it's been updated for decades and decades. So it's a, it's a highly secure operating system, but no operating system is secure because it's written by humans, right? There's flaws in everything. There will always be flaws in operating systems. So it was secure as compared to Windows at the time, specifically Windows XP was just, I mean, just a, a hot mess. It was a, it was a real big mess uh, at the time but when we were completely safe. It's actually doing much better now, and I'll get into that. So again, like I said, small numbers meant small profit. So what, what would they what would they get out of infecting us? There's not really a great advantage to using us. The main reason, though, that things got bad uh, recently was because Apple, frankly, took their eye off the ball. They did not pay attention to good security practices. So, uh, for example, the, the flashback Trojan was the biggest mess we've had. That's the number one biggest infection rate that we've had in, uh, on the Mac. And the problem was that Apple wrote its, or had its own version of Oracle and patched it on its own schedule. So Oracle went out and patched Java, and every other operating system was fine, including Windows, but Apple did not patch it for months after that vulnerability was found. So had we had our own, uh, the Oracle version of, of uh, Java, we would have been fine. In the end, uh, I don't know if you realize this, but Java is no longer uh, installed by Apple. It is installed by Oracle. So if you go to a site and you need Java, it'll say you need Java, and it takes you to java.oracle.com, I think. It used to be java.sun.com, but uh, uh, it will go get it for you. So it's not, uh, it's not installed by Apple anymore. They could have avoided this. They could have patched it the minute the other one, you know, found the patch, oh, boom, we got to do another patch of our own, and they just simply didn't do it. So I think they got cocky, and, uh, and that, was, that was a big mistake. And part of it, you know, they grew, grew complacent because nothing went wrong for so long, and maybe that was part of the problem. At the same time that Apple was taking their eye off the ball, Microsoft was keeping their eye on the ball and becoming more and more vigilant. They've implemented a couple of technologies, uh, DEP and ASLR, and I forget what the acronyms uh, are called, but they have uh, implemented those in Windows 7, and it's much, much more secure than it was. So Windows 7 out of the box is a lot better than XP, even a fully patched version of, eight, of uh, XP. Now, Apple now has the same kind of stuff that, uh, that Windows has in it, but they took a, a, a couple years longer to get to it. So it's, uh, it's kind of disappointing. I'm glad they're on the ball now, though. So the number one thing you can do to be sick is when software update says it wants to update something, say yes. Simply say yes. I mean, if you're running a giant uh, you know, network of computers and you're responsible for a hospital or something like that, okay, maybe you've got to figure out your own path. But as an individual user, you just really want to say yes. Don't procrastinate when it wants to reboot. reboot. You know, with Lion uh, and Mountain Lion, resuming win all windows uh, is, is one of the features you can have, and you can have all applications come back up, so it's much, much faster and easier to reboot than it ever used to be. I don't know about you, but I just, ah, forget it, I'll just reboot. In the old days, I would never even try, I would always try to see how long I could go without rebooting. But uh, make sure you log your applications to update as well. If you see, you know, some of the stuff like Skype doesn't come through software update, 
uh, you know, some of your applications that aren't through there, you definitely need to go check them and make sure you're getting notifications on software update. Microsoft uh, Office has its own separate updater as well. So make sure you do those and just don't procrastinate. There's really no excuse for it anymore. One misnomer, a lot of people think, well, I have an older OS, so I'll be safe because everybody's going to be out there searching for lion and mountain lion. I'm sitting on snow leopard. I'll be fine. I won't have a problem. That's actually not true. It's worse than that because uh, Apple tr traditionally in the last uh, four or five years has gotten into a cycle where they only update one system back. So right now, uh, we are not getting updates for Snow Leopard. So Lion and, and Mount Lion are getting updated, but Snow Leopard has now been left in the dust. That means that the code, remember the code has been around for decades, right? We've been working with BSP Linux, or Unix, and we've been getting updates and updates and updates, but if you have an older system, it probably has that vulnerability. The vulnerability simply wasn't found until recently. So all the old bad stuff is still in there if you've got the older version. And if you don't do the update, if you don't update to a more modern version of the operating system, you're going to be in danger. So um, you actually, a lot of people think keeping that older OS around makes them safe, and it's actually the other way around. So uh, if you're, I mean, there's really no advantage to waiting. I know a lot of people say, well, I always do one whole rev back. Well, if you're going to go forward anyway, why not go forward? Because you have to. You really, really do have to. If you've got an older system that you want to keep it running, just don't plug that Ethernet cable in or turn on that Wi-Fi, and you can keep using it as a word processor or play games or whatever you want on it. But don't be going on the Internet with a system that, that you use for, say, banking or anything like that. Any questions on that one? All right. Disable Java. Just turn it off. Most sites don't need Java. Very, very, very few sites, very few applications use Java. If you need Java, it'll tell you you, need, uh, you do need Java. One of the, uh, I got a kick out of this, I wrote a little uh, Screen Steps tutorial on how to disable Java in Chrome because it's kind of hidden. The most number of hits I've ever had on my website in the existence of podfeed.com was hitting that one thing. Because it came, I wrote it like right before the, uh, the flashback Trojan came through and so uh, apparently a few people were looking for how to do it in Chrome. Uh, you can, uh, so you can disable it in your browser directly. If you ever need it, you can re-enable it on Chrome and then disable it again. So there is a way to turn it on and off when you need it. Or you might want to dedicate one browser to using that tool that you need. Just have, say, Chrome sitting around running Java, but only use it for that. Don't also use it for other things. Uh, so Safari has gotten cool now. They automatically disable Java if you don't use it for a while. So you go a couple of weeks or whatever, it'll just stop, uh, it'll disable it, and then when you need it, it'll, it'll re-enable it. So that's kind of a nice way that Apple is keeping us safer. What kind of sites use Java? What kind of sites use Java? There, there are applications that have ever actually been written in Java. I know uh, at work we use a, uh, a, a chat client thing that lets us share our screen. So I, I don't know, does, uh, does that go to meeting use Java? Yeah, somebody stand up. Uh, well, I was just going to say, yeah, some share trading platform. I, I can't hear you from here. Sorry, Alison. Share trading platforms with complex graphing. Share trading platforms with complex graphing? Yeah, that use Java for that. Okay. God, it becomes like a desktop. It's like I like said, it. I don't know whether GoToMeeting does, but I, we use that very much like GoToMeeting where you can share screens and that sort of thing, and it does. Yeah. It's a medical application we use all the time to calculate uh, the benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy versus hormone therapy called Adjuvant Online. It's a Java based Okay, so there's a Java based app that for the medical industry. Is there somebody else? Yeah, there yeah. are a couple satellite tracking uh, graphical. A couple of satellite tracking apps. They use Java. Yeah, actually, I think I've seen that. There's, there's some things too where you can control, like you can tr control a, a, a video camera with a slider. You can rotate, like there's this great webcam in, in uh, Maui that you can watch the beach, and sometimes I just go there. I think that one might be Java as well. Now let's get into some good news. I've just been depressing you up to now, so let's, let's have some happy time. A couple of things that uh, <coughs> Apple implemented, starting with Mount Lion, are really, really cool. You might have heard these as bad things, but these are actually good things. They are Apple controlling things more, but they're doing it to keep us safer. The first thing is called Gatekeeper, and that controls how and what applications <coughs> you can install. So it's uh, actually safer to download applications now, and it's harder to get malware. So this is the security and privacy settings in your control panel. And down here, you've got three different settings. You can either allow applications only downloaded from the Mac App Store, Mac App Store and identified developers, or anywhere. 
So if you set it to the Mac App Store only, that means Apple is going to review every single application and make sure that it's safe before you get it. Basically what you go through with the iPhone is like that highest security level. But you have very, very little freedom when you do that. If an app does slip by and turns out it's got something bad in it, they can actually remove it from you so that you're, you get safe again. It's a little weird they can get their fingers in there and pull it back out, but you know, that's, that's the, the course for safety. Now this might be something you want to do for if you've got a relative that's always mucking their system up and you want to maybe tighten them down a little bit, <laughs> keep them in the Mac App Store, that might be a way to go. But if you're a more sophisticated user, that's probably going to drive you crazy after a while. So if you don't use the Mac App Store, I mean, I think everybody here has at least one application. Yeah, Frankie. Well, what about identified developers? Isn't that okay? I'll get into that right on this slide. What a great straight woman. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, in, in, if you're not always using the Mac App Store and, and you've got a developer that you know, like I showed uh, Reggie Ashworth's uh, application uh, app delete, the one I keep on my menu, menu bar for deleting applications. Apple's never going to let an app that deletes applications in the Mac App Store, right? But it's a very useful app if you know how to use it, but you can see how that would not pass muster in the Mac App Store because people might accidentally delete their stuff. So if you set it to uh, show, uh, if you set it to the, um, the second level to Mac App Store and identify developers and Reggie Ashworth is an identified developer, and I'll get into that, then you could use it. So uh, if you don't use the Mac App Store, you want to set your security preferences to allow apps from, Mac, uh, from the Mac App Store and from identified developers. What a developer has to do is they register with Apple and they get a unique ID. So that's how they're, they're identified developers, is they have this unique ID that's in their code. So they digitally sign their applications with this code. So they know exactly who it is that did it. So a malware guy is not going to go do this. And uh, I think they actually have to pay to do it. I forget how much it is. It's probably just part of the uh, developer kit. But um, the third piece of it, so you set your security preferences that way. The developers get their things uh, digitally signed and the gatekeeper checks for that digital signature and then warns you if it's not identified. The result is that unsigned apps never end up on your machine. But what if you know an app's okay? You know, what if you, you, you just, you, you know that there's, it's okay. I took an example here, there's a program called What Size that actually allows you to resize uh, images. And it's one that I know is okay, I've used it for years, I think it's fine. So I downloaded a new version of it. And it turns out you can, til you can still open it without turning off Gatekeeper. So the third choice down there was let me go crazy and do whatever I want. You don't have to turn that on to get to any old app. What you do is you control click on, on the app and you pull down to open and it'll actually warn you right here. So normally if you try to open it, this is where I tried to just open it. It says this can't be open because it's from an unidentified developer. So you just double click, it won't work. If you control click and hit open, It'll instead say, this is from an unidentified developer. Do you know what you're doing? Are you sure you want to go forward? So it'll still give you the warning, but that control click allows you to just, on a case-by-case -case basis, open stuff, but other stuff can't open itself that got downloaded to your machine through some nefarious means. Does that make sense? A uh, question about that. Yeah. Does that mean every time you want to open that app, you have to go through that? or, does it, or just The, the question was, does it mean every time you open it, you have to do that? No, just the first time. Okay. So once you oh, say it's okay, you're good. Any other questions on that? Because kind of, that threw me for a loop. I was like, oh man, the first day Gatekeeper's out, I have to turn it off because I'm playing with some goofy app. And I thought I'd have to go in there and toggle it all the time. But just that control click and open it, it fixes it. Alice, does yeah. that mean that the stuff that is already on your uh, Mac when you update uh, doesn't ever get affected by or controlled by Gatekeeper? Does that mean that the stuff that's on your Mac does not get controlled by Gatekeeper? Already, already on it. That's already on it. Yeah. I don't remember. Don, do you remember? Yeah, when, when you first install Mountain Lion, it adds all your applications into its whitelisting. Okay, Don says it puts it into the whitelist automatically. Yeah, so it's already there. It's, it's not affected by Gatekeeper. Yeah, I wasn't sure because I knew I had the problem with what, what size, but I, I do remember I had deleted it at some point along the line, and so I tried to reinstall it as a test for this. Yeah, Yeah, test. but then you'd like to be able to go back and see which ones uh, you already, that, that might not be uh, from... Uh, you'd like to go back and see? Well, I guess anything that's in your apps folder. <laughs> yeah, but how, is there a way to check to see which if... Which ones are signed? Uh, yeah. No. I don't know of a way to do that, no. I don't think so. All right. If you've been running it for a while and you're not in trouble, you're 
you know, you're probably okay. Well, it's a numbers game. As long as it doesn't allow too many of them to get infected with, with that problem. Well, they, they won't okay. get infected. It's that the person created it with the intention to infect you. Yeah. So if you've already been running it and you haven't gotten any problems, then you're probably okay. Yeah, but you wouldn't know <coughs> that for a lot of the malware. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, most apps that don't have a digital signature will eventually have a version of it. And at that point, yeah. Uh, so the the yeah. he was saying that uh, most apps when they get a version upgrade you will see that. Yeah. Okay, so he's seen it come up where he's been running it for a while and then uh, a version upgrade. Yeah, I haven't seen that yet myself, but that would make sense. I but guess. But that was a question that started this whole discussion off. You know, it, is there a way that if it's already it's whitelisted? I think uh, Don said if yeah. it's already on your computer. Okay. Yeah, but, but again, typically when there's a new version of Mac OS, they will put out a new version because of the different features that they have. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I have not seen a new version of an app cause that, but I, I believe you have. Uh, so I must just never noticed it. I've got a. Uh, a new Skype coming up. Uh, I saw it in my email that Skype had an update. When I get back, I'll check it. I'm not going to try to download Skype on the boat, though. <laughs> Come on, that's got to be a registered uh, developer, though. Oh, yeah, you're right. Well, it's Microsoft. So Even it's if fine. it has malware in it, it's still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Skype malware. won't be a good test. So if you're a sophisticated user and you want to walk on the wild side, go ahead and set that uh, allow from anywhere. And uh, Gatekeeper is going to give you one last chance to change your mind. Are you sure you want to do this? Now, realize that when you do that, you're just as insecure as you were on Lion. Right? You're not, it's not like you've stepped into the depths of hell at this point. Uh, it's no worse than Lion, but you're not getting the, one of the huge advantages of Mount Lion is having Apple be able to protect you. So I do keep it on the, uh, on the Mac App Store and identify developers. I put a link in here to Apple.com for um, uh, to get to the Mac App Store or to get to sandboxing and Gatekeeper a lot more explanation if you want to understand more about it. So the other half of the coin is we've got Gatekeeper that's you understand now how it's protecting us, but there's also the concept of sandboxing, and this has probably gotten more of a uh, an excitement from people than just about anything. Sandboxing does not require you to take any action whatsoever. The idea is that sandboxing isolates applications from critical components of the operating system. So uh, any, this again, like if you get to uh, app delete, they would never allow it in the Mac App Store because of sandboxing. So an app that's submitted to the Mac App Store has to declare what is it going to try to do. So let's say you have an app, um, an address book app might want to have access to your contacts. The developer has to tell Apple, I'm going to ask for access to the contacts. If they were to submit it and not say they needed access to the contacts, they'd get bump, bumped out. But probably, if it's, a, you know, it's an address book app, that would make sense that it could get access to the contacts. But you, they have to tell Apple what is it they want to do. Um, so one thing that's odd about this is some applications ask for access to stuff when they don't really need it. Like Google Chrome would like access to your contacts. Why? You don't need to be looking at my contacts. I'm just going to say no. And you can. You can just say no. And then if something comes up where it says, hey, you didn't give me access to your contacts. I can't do that. Then you can turn it on. But I tend to say no when it doesn't make any sense to me. A lot of times it does end up making sense, and I just didn't understand uh, how it worked. But that is a case of where uh, you, will, you will run into that from time to time, where it's asking you for stuff, and you're like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. There might be a good reason, though. Any questions on sandboxing? Allison, um, does Apple actually check to make sure that developers are lying about what they need? Does Apple make sure they're not lying? Um, like run a test to see is it trying to get access to something else? Yeah, I believe they do because they, again, if they had, hadn't said they wanted access to contacts and then it tried to get access to contacts, then they would not have uh, approved it. So I believe that is true. Any other questions on that? All right, I like the questions. So Apple's even sandboxing its own applications. Notes, Reminders, Game Center, Mail, and FaceTime are all sandboxed. So they're only allowed to do certain things. They can't get access to everything. So the result is, let's say an app is compromised by, by malicious code. It limits the damage is the main thing that it's going to do. So it's only going to hurt you from here all the way over to here because just the stuff it's authorized to access could get affected by it. So that's, that's a, a, a limitation to how much damage could happen because, again, 
these are all done by, all this is done by humans and there's going to be mistakes, but this is going to limit how bad the damage could be. Now, I said at the beginning that people are in a furor about sandboxing and that, that causes certain more creative utilities to never be able to be in the Mac App Store. I mentioned Aptly, but our favorite application here, Text Expander from Smile, uh, has, uh, is, is not allowed in the Mac App Store in the latest version. Gene's here, right? The previous version was? Yeah, that was before sandboxing. Before sandboxing. They kick you out if you're not sandboxed, but they won't. I mean, you can't do a major update. So Gene um, said you can't do a major update, but they won't kick out your old app. So if you want to get a uh, text expander, don't look for it in the Mac App Store. You want to go to Smile uh, and, and pick it up directly from them. So that's kind of a shame, but the, the good news is that Apple still has these three different levels. There's fear in the community that eventually that third level is just going to disappear, and then the second level disappears, and suddenly you're in iOS land. And um, you know we haven't seen any movement towards that, except the existence of Gatekeeper and Sandboxing makes you kind of go, well, are you going to stop letting me do everything I want to do? And I certainly hope not. I mean, I would, I would just hang myself if I had to type everything I typed. <laughs> One of the easiest things you can do uh, to, to save yourself is um, worrying about uh, yeah, clicking links in email. So have you ever seen an email that was thief at IWantToStealYourMoney.com? No, strangely, they don't actually say that, right? That's not exactly what they do it. Because the from field is actually very easy to fake. You can make that look like anything. So you never, ever, ever, ever want to click any e links in an email requesting you to update your information on the site. Even if it says it's your bank, it's Google, or Apple, or .gov, whoever the, you, they think it is, or they're pretending to be, uh, you actually don't want to ever click that. I'm going to show you an email here. Here's an email right here, if you can see this. Let's see. So this is an email from PayPal. A lot of them are from PayPal. Oh, limited account access. Oh my gosh, well, I'm on the trip. Something bad has happened. So I better click this link. And you can see down here, it says it's from PayPal.com, right? Well, that's got to be safe. Watch what happens when I hover over it. It's from USABankVerifications.com. It's not from PayPal at all. So by simply hovering over the links, you can always see whether it's really from the site you think it is. Now, when I was searching for a good example to show you guys, I found one that I thought was interesting, but it, uh, it, looked, it still looked real. It was like bbc.co.uk, but I think that isn't actually the BBC's email address, or it was going to take me through some other spot. So what you're looking for is the last words before the... Uh, let me go a little faster, slower there. The last words before .com or .au or .co.uk. Whatever it says directly, immediately before that is where the problem is. So. Oh, yeah. There we go. So if it said bankofamerica.bob.com, that's not from Bank of America. So it's whatever comes right before the .com, the .au, the .whatever at the very end, the .co.uk. So that's where you want to make sure you check it out. Yeah? You also want to check out the extension. It's paypal.cn. Oh, good point. If it's paypal.cn, that might be a little problem. Dot .ru is one of my personal favorites. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't click anything as dot .ru. Yeah. Another one is, uh, if you notice, the, uh, uh, the message begins with dear member. Mm -hmm. uh, a valid place will always address you by name. It won't say dear member. It'll say... But so that's that's what they call necessary but not sufficient. Yeah, Just right. because it said dear Allison doesn't mean it's still not malware. Of course. Then there's also the misspellings in there. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of hints to what could be going wrong. Um, this one is so easy because you just hover, take a look, and let's say it does look right, and it says bankofamerica.com. I am still never going to click that link because it's real easy to go over to bankofamerica.com with my web browser and make sure that it's a secure link and that I'm logging in without clicking anything. So uh, you, you really, really don't want to click links in there. So this is a graphic that I put in showing one of the PayPal ones, and uh, it, this example was supposed to be paypal.com, but it said eagleshell.com. <coughs> Comes in, they come in all day long. And look at that logo. That's the right logo. They look beautiful. They, they frequently, nowadays, you'll see them that have no mistakes, no, no grammar, no spelling. Yeah? There's another end to that. People have started doing the phone calling and telling you that they're from the bank. 
Oh and yeah. Asking you security questions. You right. Phone like, calling. Ring the bank back yourself and ask them if there's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. If and, and, well, whenever somebody calls for to be my bank, I, I act really alarmed. I go, oh, is there a problem? Yeah. Those guys are all hairballs. Or any racial. This is racial. I mean, our credit card services. Oh, it's not like that. Nice. Credit card services. Yeah, don't get into any of those. So an, another thing you can do is disable Flash. Flash uh, has been the source of more malware in the last uh, couple of years than almost anything. Uh, Java, you know, coming in a close second here. Um, you will run into some problems. Uh, you know, for some reason, restaurants like Flash menus. Uh, you know, and being a, being an iOS user, all of you guys know that those are the annoying sites, and you just try to go somewhere else. But most of the sites that used to use Flash for video actually use uh, H.264 codec so that it can be viewed on iOS, and so that's actually making it easier for the rest of us to get off of Flash. Um, there's a couple of ways to do it uh, temporarily. You can use Flash Block, which is a plugin for Firefox, if you like Firefox, and that allows you to just selectively turn it off. So you go to a site, like let's say you go to YouTube, you know how some, some of these sites, uh, or like Justin.tv or one of those, Ustream, they, they start a video playing right away and it's like blaring in your ears. If you have Flashbot on, you're just going to see a little arrow there where the video would be. The nice thing is it also turns off like the dancing junk in the corner in the sides that are all annoying and make you want to, you know, just go crazy. So uh, Flashbot will stop it from playing, but you can choose to play it. So if you went to YouTube and you wanted to play that movie, you just click on the, uh, on the play arrow and it starts playing. So it's a nice way to kind of straddle the world if you want to keep Flash on. For Safari, the equivalent product is called Click to Flash. It does the same kind of thing, says click to play Flash if you want to. So having that turned off is a, is a, not a lot easier. It gets rid of your animated ads. It'll make your system more stable, too, because Flash has been a lot of problems with that. Uh, this one's another side one, but it's also an Adobe product. Anything, Any site that tells you you need Adobe Acrobat, they're lying. You don't need Adobe Acrobat. You can do everything with Preview. So Preview is built into the Mac. You can use it for opening anything you want. Now, if you need to create PDFs that have you know, chapters and all that kind of nonsense that Adobe's good at, you, you need it for that. But if a website says, uh, oh, well, actually, my father-in-law uh, was going on a Holland America cruise, and in order to download its documents, it said he had to download uh, Adobe Acrobat. Sure. And yeah. it, you don't. You can, down, you can do it with Preview. It's a little bit tricky to do it, but it, absolutely they can be open with Preview. Because I don't have Adobe Acrobat on mine, and I was able to open those documents. Sometimes you have to change a file extension when you download it. Another one is uh, uh, the U.S. Postal Service. They always say you need, uh, you need uh, uh, Acrobat to play it, and you don't. You just open the file, and you download it, right-click on it, and say open with preview, and it works just fine. Is there anything wrong with that? Most of our medical journals, when we go to get articles, they're on... Uh, is there anything wrong with it? Well, just uh, Adobe Acrobat has had a whole bunch of vulnerabilities, and if you can keep from loading stuff on your system that has had vulnerabilities, you can absolutely open those, all of those medical journals with uh, Preview. Try it. Uh, you know, go to one and right click on it and say open with, uh, with Preview, and if you like, if it works just fine for you, which I don't, I don't know of any cases where it doesn't. Then you can't save it in Acrobat to your... Well, Adobe Acrobat creates PDF files. PDF files can be opened with Preview. So you can't create the complex documents that you can with Adobe Acrobat, but as a reader, uh, you don't need Adobe Acrobat to read those files. And you get other apps that will do the same thing as Adobe uh, does. Yeah, the, the problem with some of those, and in fact a lot of them, there, there have actually been flaws in the, uh, in the PDF spec itself, in which case you weren't safe even if you used uh, Preview, unfortunately. Yeah? Well, they, they, didn't they just rebrand the free version of uh, Acrobat. Saying, did they rebrand? It's called just called Adobe Reader now. It's Adobe not, Reader is not what it's called. Now I know the one for iOS is called Adobe Reader, which yeah. by the way is a good product. That actually does perform some functions you need. That, but also on the on, on the, the desktop. Pro, on and the just desktop as well, okay. It's just called Adobe. Reader. Yeah, you're, I, I believe you're right. Well, I bet it's safe now, huh? No. <laughs> so, what do you, you mentioned that you might have to change the extension with your .pdf. I, I'm, I'm just trying to remember. I know that when I download from USPS, like if I like to print my address labels and then do it from my house instead of having to go to the post office. And I know it, it, it it's like dot servlet or something. It's this real weird extension. If I just change a PDF, it goes, oh, I can open that. Any other questions on that? All right, it's time to talk about passwords. Now, this is going to be a lot easier than you think. This is it really is going to be a lot easier than you think. Help yourself there. 
I had to provide a service. So um, this really is the tuberculosis clinic today. <laughs> so I, I was worried when I did all these talks that, that I needed to talk about everything on a single topic. And uh, when, I, when I was talking to Bart, he said, Allison, only talk about what you know. So when I talk about LastPass, I am not in any way saying that you shouldn't use one password. I just don't use one password. I don't know it, I don't live it, I don't breathe it, so I can't teach you about it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. Some of my best friends like a one <laughs> password. So uh, I just want to make sure that's clear, but I'm going to talk about a, a product called LastPass. The idea is that you select one last password, and it's the only one you ever need to memorize from now on. And then you store all of your passwords in one place on lastpass.com, and all of those are uh, triggered by that one single password. Did you notice when Leo was logging into the company, the Wi-Fi on the ship, that all of a sudden each box had like a red box around it and, and everything auto-filled? That was LastPass doing that for him because he had stored his password in LastPass. So the encryption of your LastPass passwords actually happens on your computer, not theirs. So the encryption is protected because it's on your computer. They're not, they don't have the encryption algorithm. So if you lose that password, you're dead. You don't have your password to anything, so you never want to lose that last password. Yeah? I don't use this. I use some of the others, but uh, does this allow a two-stage password? Does, does this allow a two-stage password, like the, the, one, the, two the, the double page. authentication? Yeah. No, no, it doesn't. You could no. use this to remember one of the two things. So what he's talking about is called two-factor authentication. Uh, Alice, sorry, but you can turn on Google uh, authentication yeah, yeah. last pass, and, and you can assist the certain groups that it's Okay, he was talking about uh, the two-factor authentication. Let me explain what two-factor authentication is first. The idea of two-factor authentication is it's something you have and something you know. Like, have you heard about these uh, little secure ID uh, dongles that you can get? Uh, so it's got, a, pass it's got a, a code in it that's changing as a function of time, and you have your password and that code, and combined, those two things allow you to get in. So if somebody steals your password, they can't get in unless they have also stolen your little dongle. Now, of course, that got hacked, but that's a whole other story. Uh, but yeah, the through, and I have not done this, but through Google, you can set up two-factor authentication, and he sa uh, uh, Andy's saying that you can trigger that with LastPass, and I, I just don't know how to do that. Yeah, question in the front row? If we use keychain access, do we need both? If we use keychain access, do you need both? Um, if you leave your, your laptop uh, and you've got it logged in and you walk away and somebody walks up to your machine, they've got access to it. If you walk away with LastPass, as long as you set a timer to let it time out and stop staying connected, you would be protected. That would be run reason. Uh, Cass had a question first? Or? Well, no, but uh, the thing about authentication, if it's an app on your phone that comes up with the alternate key, then uh, you don't have to be connected. So I guess it does make to exercise a password. To because exercise a password. For and there are instances where you have documents that you encrypted or something like that, and you want to be able to unlock. So it. that would be an advantage. Is that something that that one password does? Or? Uh, I don't think so. But oh, okay. I, I mean, I'm going to look into it. Is yeah. there anyone that knows? One password uh, stores the stuff on your machine. But what about on your phone? Because there's a phone app, right? Oh, okay. yeah, well, it stores it. But it stores it on the phone? Yeah, yeah I don't okay. think it's uh, it's a two-factor. Okay, so, so LastPass... What are the house factors? You have to enter two codes to get into it. A four-digit code, which allows you to see the list of passwords, but before you can actually look at them, you must type in your master password. Okay, I, I don't want to get too far into the, what I don't know here, so you guys are scaring me a little bit. Uh, but uh, there, Frankie? Well, so if you have this on your, I guess you have it on your MacBook Air, but you're on your phone trying to access something? So um, I'll, I'll get into that, but um, on, on uh, LastPass has an app. If you do the paid for version, I forget what it is, it's like 12 bucks a year or something like that. It's really, really cheap. Uh, you can get a, a, a web browser uh, for called uh, LastPass. And you launch that web browser, and, and it asks you for your LastPass, and from then on, every site you go to, it automatically logs you in. So that's how I do it for my iPad. Now, I know, I know LastPass, or 1Password does something like that, but it's done a little differently. Again, I don't know that. Any other questions? Okay. So um, the, the th a lot of this stuff, I always look up like, I look like, with backups. I always knew I was supposed to do backups. It was really hard, you know, and I'd try and I'd use these tools, a retrospect, and it was just a nightmare. 
Well, when they made it easy, you plug in a backup drive, he goes, would you like to use Time Machine? Uh-huh. <laughs> then I started doing backups, right? I mean, I happen to use a different tool now, but having it spoon-fed to me, making it really easy is when I'll do it. I knew I was supposed to use different passwords on everything, so but I was lazy because it was so hard. I can't remember 400 different passwords, but it, I'm telling you, I use LastPass, and it is so easy. There's just it's criminal not to use one of these tools. So it's easy to create passwords. It's easy to enter passwords, and there's plugins for Safari, Firefox, and Chrome. So you get a little button in your password in your in your browser that you push it, enter your one password, and then every site you go to while you're active will go ahead and log you right in, and you don't have to remember them. So it's easy to create them, it's easy to enter them, uh, and again, the LastPass browser for iOS is really good. Uh, like he says, if you're not online, you don't actually have access to those passwords, but if you're not online, what is it you're logging into? Right? You sort of need to be online to, to, to need it, I think. So this is, uh, this is what, the, uh, what the site looks like, uh, the tool. Luckily, they just revamped this and it looks a lot better. It was really hard to find some of this stuff, like this Add secure note. I use secure notes to um, put uh, license keys in. So you know all those applications that you're not buying through the Mac App Store, that's making this less and less of a problem, but I've still got probably 50 apps that I bought outside of the Mac App Store that I've got a license code for and I need it when I go to uh, reinstall a new operating system or get a new Mac. This allows me to get access to those directly from uh, this secure note thing. So let's say you go to a website and you, this is, this is one of the key features of this, you go to a website and you enter your password, LastPass is gonna pop up and say, hey, would you like me to remember that for you? And at that point, you could go change it to a secure one because if you remember it, it's not secure, right? Uh, you could go in and enter it right then and fix it and make it a better one and then LastPass is gonna remember that for you. So the first time you go to a site that you haven't saved, it says, can I remember that for you? From then on, it will simply autofill that for you. You can even have it autofill and click the login button for you if you want. Now, I know my password to get into my own website. I don't bother typing it in because uh, LastPass does it for me. So that makes it really, really easy. I have chosen to trust it as far as to enter my credit card information. I don't store that anyplace else, but I have it in there. And the reason I did was because you can create autofill forms that fill in your address, phone numbers, everything else is a website's asking for. So when I go to a new site and I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, buy something, I just click the form fill button and it fills everything in for me. And I don't have to go find my card and read the thing on the back of it. What's the name of that app? This is all LastPass. LastPass. This is still LastPass, yeah. Um, with, if you don't need the web browser for uh, iOS, it's free. The only thing you pay for is that uh, access to that web browser. That's the upgrade, I think it's 12 bucks a year, like I said. Now, you should absolutely not trust me as a security expert. Do not take my word for it. But you can uh, take the word of Steve Gibson, who's a, a highly renowned security expert, and on uh, Security Now, twit.tv slash sn slash 256, he did uh, a great explanation of why it's safe and how the encryption works. And I mean, this, this guy's a crazy person on the security front, and he trusts it. So I don't trust myself to know these things, but it's his advice is why I was willing to put my credit card number in here. So where do you put your credit card number under uh, well, secure notes? Or? Uh, actually, uh, I forget. Thanks. Mm, I forget which one it was, I, and I'm not going to show you. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I can't because I'm not online. Um, it's real obvious. There's a form you can fill out that says put in your credit card information oh, okay. here. So it's, it's pretty obvious when you get in there. So you go to LastPass, you create an account, put that password on a, a piece of paper and t put it in the safe deposit box if you have to to keep track of it. But uh, don't forget that one password, and from there, then on, you can uh, uh, trust it. I think Secure Notes has subdivisions that are, notes has are, subdivisions. that are tailored for different types of... I, I think it's actually separate from Secure Notes, though. I think it's part of the form fill, maybe? Yeah. I, I, I forget. I, was, I, I think that's one of the really nice features that you've got thousands of passwords to match. You've got all those different divisions, plus you can add your own templates as well. So you can have servers, desktops, uh, yeah, it, it has a lot of variability, huh? Yeah. It, it, can, it can just do so many different things. And I rely, I mean, I used to have an Excel text file with all of my security, yeah. my, uh, just with, not with passwords, but with my, uh, um, uh, <coughs> the license keys. And that just drove me crazy because it was just so hard to keep up and look it up and everything. And, and this just really, really makes it easier. Um, it also uh, has, a, in, when you do a license key, it asks you, uh, what email address did you register this with? 
How many times have you been bitten by that? You're going, oh man, I don't know what, or I'll, I'll have something I swear I, I bought, but actually Steve bought it for me for Christmas, so it's on his email address, but I make sure I always put that in on day one and I never, never lose it. Yeah. I don't want to be a downer here, but I um, set up my mother with one password because that's the one I use. Okay. And then she had a stroke. Oh. So she couldn't remember anything. She didn't give you the password. Oh, it, did, she, did you I, have the password? I too? had her master password. Oh. So it's something to think about. She said yeah. her mother had a, a, a stroke, and, and uh, but since she had the key to her one password, so you were able to get to her accounts and take care of her. Exactly. You know, I've heard of people taking the, that one password, putting it on a piece of paper, cutting it in half, and giving it to two friends. That's that's an interesting way to go. Um, I didn't do any screenshots on this, but but uh, last password will actually auto-generate passwords for you. So you go to a new site and you click on a thing that says, "Okay, I want to I want to generate a password," and you get to decide how long and how complicated it is. And so you these are passwords you're never going to be able to remember, which means they're really really secure. And, uh, and you can uh, get those taken care of that way. So that, that's a really good way. I haven't done that completely, I gotta confess. Uh, and actually there's a, there's a tool in LastPass that I'm working on now um, that I actually heard about from Rod Simmons of the SMR podcast that in LastPass you can have it show you how many times have you used the same password. I still have a lot. <laughs> and I'm working through it because you have to go to every site and change it, but I just, every couple of weeks I sit down and I do 10 or 15, and I'm, I'm cleaning up, I'm getting better. Um, I don't have it on anything important, so I, I, I'm okay there, but uh, your judgment on what's important will be interesting when I get to the next plot line here. So how to choose good passwords. You want to make sure that they're long and complex. And this also I learned from Steve Gibson. He did a thing uh, that he called, uh, uh, he has a site called Haystack where, where <coughs> In, in the in the movies, they they sit down with the hacker and he says, "Okay, I got the first character. Oh, I got two characters. All right, I got seven of the characters. You know, they get them one by one. That's not how it actually works. They have to get the whole password to know that they got the right password. So the more characters you have, the longer it's going to take to crack. A one a one character password won't take very long at all, right? Because there's only say 26 combinations. Now let's say you add capital letters to that." That's 52 comp uh, combinations that you can have, right? That, that, that could fill it up. Now, I'm not going to do any more arithmetic than that. Steve's laughing over there because I can't add my head. But imagine that now you add uh, 0 through 1 to the possibilities. Now you've added 9 more combinations, right? And the, the What's that? 10 more. 10 more, sorry. Thank you. See, I told you I can't do Stop that right there. <laughs> yeah, I won't go any farther. But if you, if you, the longer you make your password, the harder it is to crack, and the more types of characters you put in it, the harder it is to crack. So you can picture this arithmetically increasing difficulty. It turns out that if, if you use upper, lower, upper and lowercase numbers and punctuation, adding one more character to the password makes it 64 times harder to crack. So just making it really long and making sure you have a bunch of glop in there of these different kinds of characters can make it uh, have more strength. So let's say you don't want to use LastPass. You don't trust this whole idea of anybody else storing your passwords. Bart Bouchatz, again, my security expert, has created a, a site called xkpasswd.net, and it allows you to create complex and yet memorable passwords. Now, that sounds like the opposite of what I said. I said if you can remember it, it's not complex. But what he does in his site, and he's using the tools that Steve Gibson conceived of, this haystack concept, where if you say put a dot between each word in a password, and it's a, a set of words you know, and you substitute some numbers for letters, like a three for the E, then all of a sudden, and you do upper and lower case on each word, then all of a sudden you can have something that was like horse, monkey, donkey, cow, you could actually have these, these decimals in between. This becomes an incredibly complex password. So if you go to xkpasswd.net and, and uh, try it out, you can actually play with it. You can put in passwords and you can see uh, how to create these secure passwords. One of the most important things to think about is, is when you start down the path of, okay, I'm going to get secure, is protect the crown jewels first. Anything financial, banking sites, stock trading sites. Remember I said if you're on Snow Leopard, unplug the machine uh, th that uh, is on Snow Leopard and don't let that one go to your banking sites because you're going to be in more trouble. Anything that stores your credit card, including things like your Apple ID, Skype, and stores like Amazon. Protect all your email accounts because your email accounts are often tied back to the ability for somebody to use social engineering to, to crack into your accounts. So your email passwords, you absolutely want to make sure those are super, super secure. Because you'd be surprised how connected your email accounts are to who you are on the internet. 
Uh, there was a guy recently, Matt Honan, who was, uh, was hacked quite famously, uh, and they didn't do, there was no vulnerabilities exploited to cause this hack to happen. It was all done with social engineering, taking a little bit of information from one side, a little bit from the next one, tricking people on the phone to giving information, and part of it was it was all going back to this one email address that he had. Any password uh, related to your work, you don't want to be that guy, right? You just, you just don't want to be that guy. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about silly sites. If you've got silly sites, don't ever reuse that password on a real site. And I'm going to do some open kimono confession here, but I use the same password on the silly site, Docker Media. It's like I wanted to leave a comment, and they said, oh, you got to create a login. I was like, oh, fine. I put a stupid password in that I reused everywhere. And I left it on, it was the same password I'd used on Skype. I actively did not change my Skype password because I didn't think, you know, worst case, I got to change my name on Skype. It's not like that many people know me on Skype. I, you know, 20 people I'd have to notify I'd be done. What I forgot was that I, I had auto-loaded credits from my PayPal account into Skype so that I could make landline calls with Skype. So uh, Steve and I went to the gym, and when I came back, 200 bucks was gone from my, from my PayPal account, being sucked out by somebody calling India on my, on my uh, uh, Skype account. And I, I even knew Gawker Media was hacked, but I forgot that I had that same password on Skype, and I forgot that it was connected to my bank account. So uh, that, you just, you know, if take an example for me and, and try to get them all secure. And that's why I'm cleaning up all the stupid sites, too, and I'm putting in new passwords for all of those. Any questions on that? By the way, PayPal covered everything. I, I instantly contacted PayPal. They, they froze my account. Skype froze my account. And then PayPal credited me for all of the money I'd lost. Actually, about 20 bucks, I think it was out in the end. Yeah? Is there a danger in using the same email address? For Is there a danger in using the same email address a lot of places? Well, yeah, technically, but how would you get around that? You're not going to have 400 email addresses. Spamex. Um, What's that? Spamex. Well, there is, yeah. Are, are they still in business? Yeah. So there's a site called Spamex that allows you to create spoof email addresses. So let's say you're going to write, uh, you're going to log in at Amazon. You create an account called, say, Amazon at Spamex.com. You create a, a name, and then uh, Spamex actually routes that to your real email address when something goes to that. So that is a way of creating multiple addresses. Uh, Spamex is a, is a paid-for service. It's not much either. It's like 15 bucks a year or something like that. And it also stores, um, it allows you to um, uh, keep certain emails from even coming to you. Like you want the email that's, that's uh, your order has shipped at Amazon.com. That's the one you want to get. But here's new crap you probably want at Amazon.com. You can have that one blocked. You can go through and uncheck them and say, I don't want to receive emails from these people. It's a pretty cool service. I forgot all about Spamex. Yeah, Andy, you had a comment? Uh, I was going to say you can create a... I can't hear you. Sorry. If you've got your own domain name, or, or you've got yourself your own domain name, <coughs> then you can uh, just use that with Google, set up uh, Google Apps, and you can have an unlimited number of email addresses. And so but on. how do you keep track of all of those? Well, I don't. They all just route to... To LastPass? Well, no, to one, one email box. Oh, okay. And so every site, Gawker, I have, you know, Gawker app, xyz.com. Yeah, no, he just said, just get Google Apps. Google Apps is complicated. I've set it up, but I could never do it again. <laughs> yeah? You can use the plus extension on your Google email address to get the yeah. email Yeah, he was saying you can use the plus extension. So you put it, I, I forget how that works. If my email address is nocellacast at gmail.com, would be nocellacast plus Amazon at gmail.com, so you could do that. You can also put any number of dots inside the from the part of your Gmail. Email yeah, I've, I've heard that. You can put any number of dots. So I could have no, nos dot i l l dot. So a lot of people see the see say their their address is mary dot smith at gmail dot com. Their email address is actually mary smith at gmail dot com. But it's put you can put those dots anywhere you want. It'd be easier to use that plus thing. I've heard about that, but I thought that got discontinued or yeah, it's, still it's still working. Oh, that's good advice. I'm not energetic enough to that. I'm going to go finish cleaning up my Gawker Media type stuff first. All right, is it time for antivirus? I'm going to say yes. But I'm going to say yes with something that's very light, it's free, and it's very easy to do, and it's not going to interrupt your life. So there's an app called ClamX from ClamXAV.com. This is a very, very unintrusive app if you set it up the way I'm going to show you. 
it's very easy to set it up in a way that it's extremely annoying, which is the way I did it at first. So uh, it does add a layer of protection, and uh, I have messed with the configurations, and I've got a, uh, I've got a configuration. Of course, I have a tutorial in Screen Steps. Whoops. Let's go back here. Let's put this. All right. So I'll start in Screen Steps just to prove to you that that's where I, uh, where I created it, of course. So uh, here it is. And uh, I, I want to give credit to, um, oh, I promised I'd remember his name. Last name is Mueller. Can almost remember <laughs> Mueller, not Bueller. Uh, a, a German uh, listener sent me, sent me an email today, or that I got today, that explained that I had actually made a, made a mistake in my tutorial. So I was able to go into Screen wow. Steps, edit it, and recreate it. So uh, let's go ahead. This is the one I just did. So we're going to export it to PDF. I want to make sure I have the latest version. And we'll save that. It's going to say, do you want to replace it? Because I already did it. So um, this, is a, this is on my website. So if you go to tutorials, it's called How to Install and Configure Climax AV Antivirus for Mac. And this will come up in just a second here. So I'm going to bring up Climax AV and kind of switch back and forth between the preferences here. So these instructions are for Snow Leopard and higher, so they work with, uh, with Snow Leopard, Lion, and Mountain Lion. And uh, the first thing is that you, you can get it directly from the Mac App Store, but if you do, it doesn't have the Sentry tool. And I'm going to show you what the Sentry tool does, so I think it's better to go to ClamXAV.com and get it from there. So again, these are from Snow Leopard and higher. If you're running even older than that, if you're really on the wild side, even though I told you not to, uh, actually Snow Leopard, since I wrote these, isn't safe now, uh, but uh, you will be able to install it, but you have to you have to do some other mucking around, and the instructions are right here. <laughs> so after you install it, you're going to log out and log back in, and we're going to go into the um, let's see, we're going to go into the uh, preferences here. So let's see, what did I say to do? Oops, there we go. So we're going to go up to oh, the first thing you're going to do when you install it is you're going to update the virus definitions. So a virus definitions file, you know, Windows people know all this, but a virus definitions file is a file that contains all of the known bad stuff. So if you're not letting it in, uh, update the definitions, you're not doing yourself any good because when the new stuff comes out, they've got to get the new stuff into the virus definitions. So the first thing after you install it you want to do is you want to update the definitions. From there, we're going to go into preferences. And yeah, me cheat, keep looking at my instructions. So you can set this any way you like. But I actually believe that, uh, that you should uncheck, and this seems really strange, uncheck scan email content for malware and phishing. This is the one I had checked on at first. Do you know how much malware is sitting in your spam box right now on Gmail or wherever you've got it? Billions and billions of files. So it was like, found something, found something, found something, found something. I mean, it was just constant. In fact, my father-in-law noticed it first because I'd set it up for him. He's like, you're killing me here. This is horrible. So I actually uncheck that. And you'll think I'm being stupid here because I, I uncheck update virus definitions on launch right after I just told you to update the virus definitions. What you want to do is have it updating on a schedule. You don't want it just when you launch the app because you're not going to be launching it that often. So you're going to actually uncheck that on, on uh, both of these. Again, you can do it any way you want. But you, have, you have fun there. So the next thing you're going to do is you're going to go to the Sentry, and this is where uh, Clam XAV will just simply keep an eye on a, sim on a folder. Now, when I first did this, I did it uh, doing my entire home folder. But guess what's in your home folder? Your mailbox. <laughs> so there we were back in that agony again. So uh, all you have to do is drag your downloads folder into here, or you can simply hear it, hit the plus key and navigate your downloads and have it start watching that. So this is where Sentry comes in real handy, and that's why I, it's still free, but it's not in the Mac App Store like that. So let's see, we're going to drag our home folder, and now your, home, your uh, downloads folder is going to be monitored. The other thing I did was I go into the schedule and I set it to, uh, it's off right now. Wait a minute, wait, let me double check why do I have it off. That's interesting. I would like to pretend I was that smart that I turned it off while I was on the ship. Yes, we, we will accept that as the answer. 
think I'll do that again. And it was supposed to be at 6.45 a.m. It's probably good. It, it actually it might be that. It might have come up now that I think about it. Yeah. You're in a different time zone now, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it was trying to go off when it was, and I wasn't connected. I, we will definitely go with that answer. But uh, so you just set it to tell it to do it sometime when you're awake. Like, what time do you open your machine first thing in the morning? If you're like me, it's the instant I get up, and that couldn't run right then. And the virus definition files are very, very small, so it's not a big deal. They come down very quickly. <coughs> now, it is a good idea to run a full scan. You know, you were saying, how do you know if you might already have malware? You can set it to do a full scan. And uh, so right in the upper left there, if I close out of our preferences, you can simply say, scan, you know, scan Allison and push that button. If I did that, we'd be here for a very, very long time. It took uh, three hours for my home folder. My home folder is giant. I mean, it's hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes, so yours might not be that bad. Uh, the first time I ran it, it found 450.emix files. Oh, what's that? EMIX or emails. So that's how much garbage it had. If you d empty your spam folder first before you run it, it'll go a lot faster because it won't be finding all that junk. So, uh, I, but you know, in the time it takes to run three hours, there's probably a bunch more junk in there because it's coming pretty fast. So once you have that set up, uh, your your machine is clean and you're and you're fine. There's also a service, remember we learned about services from Sal, there's a service that will actually scan, uh, you can tell it to scan a folder or a file, so let's see if I've got it running enough that I could do that. Let's see if I right click, services, is it there? Scan, yeah, scan with Pemex yep. AV, so I could scan it and it would tell me it was okay. Yeah, it's telling me my, my uh, uh, virus definitions are date. there, it scanned it, it says there's nothing wrong with it. So that's a service that gets installed when you, uh, when you actually install um, Climax AV. <coughs> So if you are running Snow Leopard, uh, you do have to do a little bit of shenanigans, but it's in the, uh, there's a readme file called how to install the plugin and you have to do it by hand. If you're running Line or, or uh, uh, Mount Line, it'll do that automatically. Any questions on that? This really is a one-time setup. Bang through the instructions, you're not gonna have to worry about it again. And I, I once I got it to stop yelling at me about my, uh, about my emails, it was uh, much less intrusive. It, it, it hasn't bothered me at all. Yeah. I, I think it, there's no sense in having an awareness of whether or not this is malware for a PC versus the Mac. Yeah, see, a lot of yeah, a lot of stuff in your mail is probably um, for uh, the PC. So you're probably right. Why am I in this one? There we go. Yeah, you know, you just want it to go away, but you can actually remove it. But I should have pointed that out. If it does find something, you can quarantine it or have it removed. What about virtual machines? What about virtual machines? So in, if you've got a virtual machine running Windows, you really, 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 really want to have a, 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 a antivirus on those machines. And also keep them up to date. One of the nice things on, uh, on my show uh, every week, or every other week when Bart's on, he um, updates us on what, it, tells us when it's time to go wake up our virtual machines and run software update over on, on the Windows side. So that is, that's a, a good, important thing to do there. Does Climax work on Windows? Climax does not work on Windows. I Think well, it works on the emails. But it sure. does work on the emails that yeah. might have Windows viruses in it. Yeah, <coughs> the virus definitions file is really teeny because there still aren't very many. It's still really small. Yeah. You, you have a noticeable slowdown on your machine with this? I have not noticed any slowdown. Windows machines are notorious. Yeah, mach Windows machines are notorious for that. Down. And remember, we're not, we're not scanning the whole drive. If you had it scanning the whole drive all the time, I bet you would notice it. But if you just have it watch your downloads folder, that's everything new. Anything you create, you'd be getting elsewhere. I mean, I suppose somebody could put something nasty in your Dropbox or something like that, and you might be due. Well, if you get yeah. a USB stick, you stick it in and you download yeah. a file that way. Yeah, you USB should be stick. checking. Well, you could have it. You could uh, tell it to scan the USB stick when you stick it in. It might be too late, but any you find out if it were there. Any incoming file. Yeah, any incoming file. All right. So, special thanks again to Bart Bouchotts from bartb.ie. He. Uh, uh, I, I, I came up with the idea of what I was going to say, but it was a big jumbled mess. So the fact that this was a nice cohesive plot and is actually factually correct, I would put uh, to uh, Bart. If you have any questions, uh, his Twitter name is Shots, which is impossible to spell, so that's why you make a text expander snippet for it. At least that's what I do, because I've known him for five years and I think I've spelled it right twice. Uh, he's on the International Mac Podcast. He hosts that. Uh, he and Stu Helm are the, are the hosts. They alternate each week who is the... Uh, Host of that, that's another great uh, Mac podcast you can listen to. Uh, before I close out, I want to tell you guys, uh, after I'm done, uh, Steve has two videos that he's created of the Eclipse. One is a GoPro video showing our reaction on the, on the, uh, uh, on the, the front deck. 
and it's it's pretty cool. It's it's would be very very long, of course, but he sped it up 20x, and then he slows it down as we go through the totality. So it's it's really cool. And the other one is of the eclipse itself. So if you want to stick around for that, that's great. I won't be offended. Maybe Steve will if you leave. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to show that when I'm done. And uh, so I'm sad. This is my last talk. This was oh. so much fun. Yay. talking, Steve and I were talking about what was better than we expected on this trip, and it was you guys and how much I learned when I was talking, and I learned seven things today just in this talk, so I really want to thank you. I had the best time doing this, and I, I'm really sad that this is over.